Hey guys, welcome back to Mindful Mondays, an In the Mind of Frage production. We are underway in an eight-part series all about emotionally focused couples therapy. It's a therapy that's been around for a long time, but it seems like only recently it's come to light. And it's a form of couples therapy, but also individual therapy. Relationships are one of the hardest things that we have to deal with in our entire lives. Living with someone, being married to someone, dating people long term, very, very difficult. So Lee Conan is an emotionally focused couples therapist in Falls Church, Virginia. I've been to her. I love her. She truly helps you connect with your partner in a way that we're just never taught. It's just crazy all the things that we like never learn. I mean, screw calculus. Who needed that, folks? We needed to be emotionally connected with other people. So today's episode is episode three. It's all about why are relationships so fucking hard? Why are they? Uh, We take a look at some of the biggest issues facing couples today, whether you're married, whether you're single, and also how much does your parents play a role, their relationship, what you grew grew up seeing, how much does that play a role in how you are in your relationship today? So enjoy the podcast. I love you. Please, if you like this episode, share it with someone who's never heard of me. And head to iTunes, hit five stars, leave me a review, and tell me what you love. Thanks, guys. Enjoy. Um, Lee Conan is here, and this is episode three of our Mindful Mondays series, and we're taking a look at emotionally focused couples therapy. I love this. I have been a client of Lee's and totally changed the way I interact with my significant other and truly did save our relationship Mm -hmm. because, um, you know, both of us, great people, but just we're not on the same page of what we needed. Um, So I love that you are here sharing this. Yeah, thank you. I love being here. Um, On today's episode for episode three, we're going to talk about attachment theory, which Lee will break down exactly what that means and how it applies to you and your relationship. And then also we kind of touched on this on episode two, Lee, of some of the biggest um, issues facing couples today. Mm -hmm. Um, But I wanted to get into it because this was a theme when I was seeing you, when we came to you a lot, is how much does your parents' relationship Mm. play a role in how you play out your relationship? seems like it has a big impact. And I know, you know, from uh, my listeners that I get wonderful emails, but lo- all of us have issues with right. from our parents. You know, yeah. one of the things I had to talk to you about in one of the similarities that Dan and I have is we both lost our dads. Yes. Um, and we both had great family units. Mm-hmm. So, but lots of people listening to this, their parents are either divorced, don't speak, mm-hmm. cheat, one cheated on each other, you know, the whole time. Um, and I think that becomes very scary for people of how you don't repeat that. Absolutely. Yes. And our, our families that we grow up in, um, and the people that care for us become our blueprints for how to be in relationships. Kind of what happens is we develop a map within our own mind of what healthy relationships look like or unhealthy relationships look like based on what we observe in our life. Mm -hmm. And so our, our, our parents' relationships do, in a way, become blueprints for how we may be in relationships. And that's something we've got to become aware of. Oh, my God. So yeah. how do you mm-hmm. even break that pattern? Like when you so so tell walk us through this, mm-hmm. like when couples come in to see you, mm-hmm. um, what are some of the things that like they saw in their parents' relationships that have now spilt over? Yes. One of the big things is dismissing of emotion. Right. So we become disconnected from our own emotion when um, difficult things maybe aren't talked about in families or when something happens and um, someone says, you'll be fine or just get over it or suck it up and move on. What's happening then is we're learning not to pay attention to our emotion and we'll have patterns of not then paying attention to our needs either. And so those are some things we talk about in the initial sessions or what are some patterns that have been in people's life, just so we can become aware of how they respond to 
to things and where that kind of has been learned in their life experiences. Okay. So what are some examples? Can you take mm-hmm. us through one, a, a pattern, um, or like, um, what would it typically look like if you grew up in a family where they dismissed your emotions or they, like, yeah. I'm assuming, or something big happened mm-hmm. and then nobody talks about it. Right. So, um, I've had instances where, where people share different things about, yeah, when I was really struggling in school, no one really helped me with it or paid attention to that. Or maybe I was bullied and nobody did anything about it then. So I was kind of dealing with it by myself or when my parents divorced, nobody talked about it. And I, you know, so it became this oftentimes emotional disconnection is because people don't know how to talk about things or there was a lot of conflict. People fear talking about things. Mm. And so what they don't want to happen is, wow, when somebody brings something up in the back of their mind, they may be fearing, oh no, this is going to turn into a bigger conflict. So I don't want to bring something up. And so those are patterns that oftentimes we're unaware of that that we've experienced in our life and not just from our family environment, but from our school environment, from friendships, from work environments that can all impact how we disconnect or disengage from our emotional experience. Oh my God. And I can imagine those yeah. play in big time. You know, if you were struggling in school or if you were bullied and your parents tell you, you know, just to kind of get over it, right. um, that must show up a yes. lot in other yeah. relationships. Yeah, it absolutely can. And another thing is sometimes it's not even saying get over it. Sometimes it's just ignoring that something's important. Mm. And what um, attachment theory, which I know we'll get into and talk more about, what we find is that we develop procedural scripts Okay. Which is kind of our memory system of, of how we store memory and how we anticipate what's going to happen next to survive. And when our brain is able to do that, we become more efficient at surviving because we can anticipate the pattern coming next. And so what can happen, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of interactions between you and your partner or you and other important people in your life help develop these procedural scripts um, that determine how you view yourself in the world and how you view other people. Wow. And yes. I mean, and that was, yeah, that's so hard. Cause I mean, I'm mm-hmm. sure no one's is like all positive and upbeat on themselves. Right. <laughs> like it's all yeah. ours. It must be like, everyone's messed up. Right. Right. We all have our things. Right. We all have our <laughs> things. Right. All right. Well, this is then a good moment to get into what is attachment theory? How does that play in, um, to a couple or if you are a single person, what is that? Yeah. Yes. So attachment theory was originally um, developed by John Bowlby. He was actually um, an Englishman who, who studied what patterns of interaction look like between caregivers and children. And so what was developed is this theory of how we bond. We are social creatures. We are actually biologically wired to need other people to survive in life. Mm. And we need it from cradle to grave. It doesn't, we don't just need it at the early times in our life. We need it just as much as adults. Wow. And so how that was developed is um, when they were watching interactions, they were able to discover predictable patterns of behaviors when a child was in distress. And so now we know in adult relationships, we tend to do the same patterns of, of behavior when we're in distress that we did when we were growing up. So we've learned this way to either, um, up our, our need for other people. And so we might move into behaviors of what we would call pursuing, where we kind of cling and seek our partner to help when we're in distress, or we learn to turn off our need for others because, um, and withdraw from emotion, withdraw from relationships. And oftentimes that's what we see in our, our culture today is we've turned off our need for other people because culturally we're kind of taught self-sufficiency is king, wow. but that's wrong. Really? Yes. Oh my God. That's amazing. I don't even think I really realized how much we do need other people. Yes. Wow. Yes. And needing other people, actually, when we're in distress, we need to borrow someone else's nervous system, someone whose nervous system isn't in distress. And when we can do that, actually, our nervous system will help down-regulate and come out of stress more efficiently and um, quicker. 
Oh my God. Yes. And it's called, there's been a lot of research by a gentleman named uh, Dr. Jim Cohn out of the University of Virginia that has developed um, this idea that he calls social baseline theory. And it's all about how we bond and how, how other people help us when we're in distress. And there's been... He's put people in fMRI machines and worked with kind of giving them a, a prick on their toe and or somewhere you know on their hand on or their, their toe. Sure. I'm not sure. I'd have to read the study to remember which <laughs> um, leg, arm, whatever. Yes, and he's able to see in the brain where physical pain registers. Well, then when he brings in someone to hold their hand, a partner that they feel connected to, that they feel healthy and safe with, um, their brain when they're pricked in the same way almost doesn't register the pain at all. Really? Yes. And so he calls this co-regulation, just the act of someone being with you in distress that you trust and that you have a healthy relationship with, your pain pretty much doesn't register. Oh my God, that's amazing. Yes. Okay, the next time I get in an argument or something, mm-hmm. I'm stressed. Excuse me, can I borrow your nervous system? Like, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> your not stressed nervous system. Yes, absolutely. That's pretty amazing. So that must be, I mean, now people are like single longer than ever. I mean, mm. what do you, what's your theory on that then? Do you think that's a really kind of bad trend that yeah. people... You know, it's interesting. Um, I think that trend can be a couple different reasons. One is we are getting in relationships now more than ever for happiness, not because we, we need financial security or necessarily physical security, because we can kind of get that on our own. So I think in one, in one way, people are saying, well, I can have my, my physical needs met. I can do that myself, but I really want to wait for someone who can meet my emotional needs. So that may be a reason. I think another reason may be that people have turned off their emotional need. Maybe they've had experiences in their life where they've learned not to trust others. And so the only way to serve them for to survive then is to they've had to turn off their need for others. Wow. Yeah. And do you think that's just happening more um now because of things like it's easier to isolate where you sort of mm-hmm. have the internet and you right. you know can just go home and watch a thousand yes. TV channels and you can interact with somebody maybe just over your computer screen and that's it. Yes. And I think I think the distractions in our life right now get in the way of connection. So whether it's technology, whether it's our um you know, environment where we feel like we have to do more and be more, where is actually eroding the time we have to connect with people. And wow. then to deal with that, we just go to things that we know that'll be there, like technology or TV, or sometimes people move um, to addictions as coping patterns to deal with the distress of not being connected but a lot of people don't realize that's what they're doing. What's one thing you can do? I'm sure a ton of people are listening to this. Either, um, you know, our audience is about 50% single, 50% married. For the people that are single and feel like, oh, I'm holding out for someone that can really meet my emotional needs. Is that realistic? I think it can be. Okay. Yeah, if you find a partner that's in your same place as you, I think that's a that's a great thing to do. I mean, that's what dating's about, right? right? It's about finding the person that is kind of at your same place, hopefully. And um, it takes time to do that. So people should not be discouraged because, you know, in this town, everybody Mm -hmm. is like, oh, it's, you know, the D.C. area is the worst to date and people Uh. are terrible. And so do you feel like because my thing Mm -hmm. has always been when my girlfriends say that I'm like, but if you think about it, we're probably going to walk this earth with one, maybe two, maybe three people for a long period of time. I mean, it's going to take a long time to find weed everybody. Right. Right. (laughs) Yes, it is. So why do you think people get so discouraged so quickly? It's just I think it's back to our basic survival need, right? Mm. Back to how we are biologically wired in to need other people. And so I think when we're not finding it, we get discouraged that is it out there? Because this need is so important for us and we long for it. And so when it's not there, we miss it and we're always searching for it. And I think maybe not finding it discourages people that is it out there. And how do you find it? You do kind of healing yourself. Yeah. Is that sort of the way once you've healed yourself and you mm-hmm. recognize the detachment issues or the hurt yes. that you're covering up, then you become more open? Right. Absolutely. I know wow. some some individual clients I work with come in around this idea of I'm not good in relationships. 
what is it about me that I'm either doing this, these patterns of clinging and seeking or these patterns of withdrawal? And so what we're able to do in, in emotion-focused work is really help them tune into themselves, get a clear understanding of what's happening and either what their their need is in relationship and how that's getting maybe because it's not clear to them it doesn't clearly get communicated to other people in their life or they're shut off from it and i have to help people reconnect with their survival need for others amazing well that actually leads me to this because this Mm -hmm. was brought up is um we know that you take on couples Uh, leeconan.com is lee's website but you also see individual patients patients right that are just single or yes really Mm -hmm. I okay, sure that's fantastic. And so yeah. anybody can come see you that feels like they, you know, are having trouble in relationships, yes. you know, have kind of become discouraged. Yes, absolutely. I've worked with people, you know, after they've divorced in relationships and are looking to go, okay, I don't want this to happen again in my next relationship. What can I help focus on for myself? I've worked with people that are struggling to find a relationship for them. Um, so with that focus on, on their self-discovery, we can help them then be better able to delineate who's right for them and how are they going to know that? Right. Oh my God. I love that. Uh-huh. Um, Lee Conan is currently, she has a waiting list for clients. You can go to leeconan.com. Mm-hmm. Um, for anybody that listened to this episode, if you are single, tell yes. us what you feel like is your biggest struggle. I bet uh-huh. something really struck a chord today. So you can head to my Facebook page. It's Sarah Frazier. Just hit pages on Facebook. I'll post the question up there. If you're single, do you feel mm-hmm. like, um, you know, you're just so detached that you feel like nobody can meet your needs. You're not good at relationships. We'd love to hear that. And I'm very excited because coming up on episode four, we're going to do our first exercise that you guys can do at home and it's called the infinity loop. So Lee is going to explain that next. We'll see you guys next week. Take care.